Hi, everyone. Welcome to Stars and Pearls. Welcome to those of you that are new to this channel. I'm so excited to have you here. Don't forget to click like, subscribe, and share. Those of you that are returning watchers, thank you so much for your support. I am super happy to be introducing Kat Rambo to you today. And Kat is an integration specialist, integration therapist, healer, amongst many other things. And um, she has a lot of interesting information, which I felt needed to get out there, especially about medicine. So we're going to dive into a little bit of her history, her background, and the knowledge and messages that she has to share regarding me um, medicines and the integration of medicines. So it's a topic that's near and dear to me. Kat, thank you so much for joining me here. And thank you for being a part of this. <laughs> and thank you for letting me interview you and talk to you. I'm so glad, so happy. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. An opportunity to share is always a blessing. And uh, I've so enjoyed getting to know you. It is just fun now, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. The way yeah. it be. It, it's been amazing working with you. And I feel every healer needs a healer. So I'm happy to introduce one of my healing team who's become really significant over the last couple, the times that we've been working together. It's been absolutely fantastic and amazing. And um, yeah, I'm just so happy. So let's get started. Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Ooh, what do you want to know? <laughs> yeah, everything. <laughs> All right, well, how about... Like, um, what did you do before medicines? Yeah, so. how about a little bit about the journey that brought me here? So yeah. uh, even as I was um, completing my uh, university education in finance, <laughs> of all things, yeah. uh, international business, economics, I was... Um, I was involving myself in uh, experiential wisdom moments, and I started becoming um, very connected to the options available to me, which were, of course, I was in college, so it was cannabis and psilocybin mushrooms and a bunch of other stuff. Um, I really liked the psychedelics, and I had a few experiences which showed me that the connection that I was experiencing with these things was different. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't really get it at the time. Um, it was only after that, that I, you know, I, I grew up with, uh, my family's from Louisiana. That's a little all over the place. Right? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I grew up with a little bit of voodoo and root work and spirituality and alternative perspectives. I got lucky. My father's a Methodist. My mom was pagan. So I grew, got to experience a lot of different things um, and, and see the similarities that we all really share. You know, we always had different practices. I had an uncle who was Jewish and a friend who was a Swami, and we would always come together and celebrate. And so I got to explore um, that no matter what we're into, we're all really looking for the same thing, you know, which is awesome. Yeah. So uh, I think when I started working with, and at the time I wouldn't have called it working with, but now that I look back, working with mushrooms and these other things uh, in university, I already had a foundation of we're all looking for the same thing. You know, we all really want the same things. We're all really one curiosity in the world, right? right? So I think that benefited me a lot. And then when I ended up moving into um, herbalism work is because I got sick, you know, and, and the people around me were sick. So I said, I'm going to find an answer. And I was already interested in these topics. But then the more I started exploring, looking for answers, the more I became obsessed. So right. I opened in practice. I was doing that for a while, uh, kind of in conjunction with business coaching and financial advising and um, commercial real estate and some other things in that sphere. And then uh, I hit a point in my life where everything sort of fell apart. Yeah. And uh, I, I even recognize now, now as I was walking out of the hospital at 3.30 in the morning after a nasty car crash and my mother came to collect me because I had apparently lost everything. And I started laughing and she's like, why are you laughing? And I said, I'm so lucky. She goes, Kat, you almost died. Like what's happening? You've lost everything in your life. Everything's falling apart. Why are you happy? So because it's a fresh start, it's a clean slate. I know what I'm doing isn't right. I need something else. And now I'm going to sit still. Yeah. She's like, what do you mean? And so I did the one thing that I never had done in my life before, which is just sit still for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I started to pray. And I said, you know, obviously what I'm doing isn't working. I don't know how to thrive. Everything that I've tried so hard to achieve is falling apart. What do I do? And I had already been um, involving myself in healing work. I'd already been doing herbalism, energy work. I'd educated myself in these things. I'd done some training. You know, I've, I've been involved in medicine ceremonies. And every time I always end up working them, <laughs> even when I didn't go there to work. You know, and uh, I loved it. I loved it, and apparently I was good at it. So uh, when I sat still, when I started praying, and I said, "All right, whatever's out there, whatever it is, whether it's God or a great spirit or the 
collective quantum strata. I don't care. Like whatever is out there that's bigger and connects us all, whatever comes up for me, that is what I will do without Mm -hmm. fear. And um, I let go of all of the titles, all of the social requirements, all of the, you need to be a whatever, you know, in the world and, you know, be successful, whatever that means, you know, and I dropped all of that. I shed it all and really went through a full identity shift. And within 72 hours, I got my answer. Not only did I have three requests for um, coaching from various corners of my life, uh, I also got invitations to start participating in leadership capacity in medicine work, and it just sort of swelled up. So I said, all right, I'm gonna get educated. So I love education, I love knowledge, I love learning. So I got certified in everything from NLP to hypnosis to uh, transformation coaching process to you know, psychology to psionic skills. I mean, everything I could find. Right. Mm. And um, I found that that actually has been what I have discovered is kind of unusual in medicine work. Usually what happens is it's just the call of the medicine and then the medicine work and the, the traditional infrastructure is what's learned first. And I think that coming in with a perspective of education and knowledge has been a little bit different, but has enabled me to become very excellent at what I do, because I also see the human transformation process, the psychological process. I have other tools that I work with besides just medicines that really cause um, what I have discovered is my favorite place to be, which is in between the ancient traditions and the modern tools and finding ways to bring those together. And that's why I became so obsessed with integration work. I think that that's the thing that's missing right right now. Yes. I'm seeing rise more and more, and that's great. I see some integration practices that I find lacking. I see some that I find phenomenal. And I see people in my practice a lot who never had proper integration, not really. And mm-hmm. I see a lot of suffering as a result. In our modern cultural context, we have no way to access what's available in sacred medicine experiences, though it is often possible to have an amazing experience uh, without any preparation. This is available. It's also unreliable and unexpectable. That makes sense, right? You can't expect to have an amazing experience if you don't understand what the experience is about. So we barely know how to interpret dreams, but we're supposed to know how to navigate a visionary in that experiences (laughs) while also having no concept of the the cultural framework that surrounds these medicines. So you have a practitioner administering a very strong experience to someone who has no framework for understanding it Mm -hmm. and is expected to know how to integrate that too. I think that's unfair. And the good news is these medicines are spreading quickly everywhere. They've become available to us. We're really getting the benefit of these experiential moments of turning that light bulb on inside, having a reset, um, having an experience of something bigger than yourself. These moments are totally transformational. And I see a lot of my clients go back to their old patterns because they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So I think that integration more than the experience itself has become essential. I know it's kind of like a little roundabout, but I think that's really what brought me to where I am, a fascination with understanding how things work. Mm -hmm. Even in my interest in economics and finance, it was how to put things together. How can things work? How can I restructure debt uh, on a commercial property in a way that makes sense moving forward and works for the future of this project? Like, Mm -hmm. And the same thing applies, the same mindset applies to the work I do now. How can I take this thing that we have, this experience, this possibility, make it more possible to have a meaningful experience mm-hmm. and an easier experience, right? right? And then how to take what is seen and turn it into something useful. In the cultural context in which these practices developed, that integration and preparation experience was considered obvious, right? Because these cultures have an understanding of what those visions mean, how to interpret that, what it means to navigate them. Children are administered these medicines. They grow up in the shamanic context, which means the idea that everything has a spirit is obvious and clear. For us, it's not. We're coming from a materialistic scientific perspective. There's not something wrong with that. It's just so different that sometimes it's hard to uh, marry the experience into a new life and make it mean something. And Mm -hmm. I do not feel that the experience for the experience sake is um, necessarily a bad thing, but it's not a useful thing. And I'm very practical. So again, probably something that is a little different in this space, but I believe in the practicality because that's when it can really change our life. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> roundabout, but absolutely. I know we're talking about you said, and I, I especially like the part where you mentioned, we don't even know how to interpret our dreams, but we go right. and drink this medicine and think, oh yeah, now we found enlightenment and we, we right. understand everything that we experience because- Clearly not. <laughs> so that's that's amazing. So what brought you 
Like, what was your experience that actually got you working with medicines in the capacity where you felt I'm ready? I'm going to be an integration therapist. I'm going to be a specialist. I wish I could say there was a moment where I made a decision, but mm -hmm. there wasn't. Right. Um, the only decision I made was just to say yes to whatever came up, and it just uh -huh. exploded in my life. Even the way I came to the medicines was organic and it just sort of happened. And I get asked like, Oh, what was your intention for your first ceremony? Like, I don't know if I really have one. I, I don't know. I, it just, I thought of it and it came to me or I've started having dreams and then I would appear in the setting. And a lot of times I had no idea what I was getting into at first. Um, but I, I got it, you know, and I will say that out of some of the medicines that I've worked with, my first experiences were very difficult. <laughs> it wasn't like a joyful, blissful, enlightening moment. It mm -hmm. was hard. It was intense. And I, I understood immediately, I think, because of its difficulty, that this had to become something meaningful. You know, I had to make it mean something useful. Why go through something difficult? You know, and, and the, the way that I came to these medicines wasn't, wasn't intentional. It right. just sort of happened. But I already had a deep relationship with herbal medicine yes. and energy work mm -hmm. and uh, psychic skills. You know, I've been doing card reading since I was a kid, you know, <laughs> stuff like this. Yeah. So I think that I got lucky because I had a foundation already. So when I started learning and training and I got very lucky with good teachers, actually, that really helped me a lot. Uh, the maestro that I work with currently is unbelievable. She is what is lost in the shamanic arts. She mm -hmm. is a true intermediary between this world and the multitude of dimensions available across mm -hmm. the veil, right? And so I got very lucky with that. And that really helped me a lot too, having that type of structure. And her expectation is also excellent. And I really value that, you know? <laughs> Does that make sense? Did I answer a question? <laughs> yeah, all of the, like, it's, uh, <laughs> we're talking. <laughs> so, what is the definition of a shaman? Like a real definition of a shaman? Because I feel like a lot of people have um, misunderstandings around that. And that's where the whole distortion already begins when they dive into the medicine world. And they, right. they you know. I think my answer to this is probably going to be polarizing. To that's be honest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've been in this field for a long time now. Yeah. And I have seen where I went from, you know, what does that word mean? Or, you know, how do I explain this in another way? I would just say holistic health professional, you know, I wouldn't really talk about the, the shamanism because it didn't mean anything, you know, like, oh, what's that? You know, this image of Siberian or Norse you know, mystics with antlers and no eyes and, you know, <laughs> like would come to mind. You know, this is before medicines were really, especially um, South American medicines, especially right. ayahuasca and combo, wherever like really... There wasn't a lot of knowledge about it. So when I first started in this space, there was a very specific definition for that word. And I think that definition is evolving. I think I have to grow up with the new definition because the first time I started seeing that, I was appalled. <laughs> I realized the traditional definition of a shaman is a spiritual and social leader. And this, this isn't always a celebrated figure. This, these people sometimes live on the fringe of morality. You know, yes. this is also who's doing the human sacrifices to bring in the rains. You know, the shaman isn't necessarily like a celebrated center of the community. They usually live kind of on the fringes. They're there as a necessary evil. Sometimes you, <laughs> they're sort of yeah. ambiguous figures, yeah. right? And sometimes they are and sometimes they're not, you know, but a healer of that is a shaman specifically is someone who in shocking similarity around the world, actually, in ancient cultures, this is our oldest form of religion, uh, is someone who enters into a trance state in some way. And then in that space becomes an intermediary between this realm and the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. In some cultures, that's the above realms, the middle worlds and the lower worlds. You know, in some places, that's this, this dimension in the land of the Fae. You know, in some traditions, that's you know, this reality and the land of spirit, whatever that may be, where all the spirits are, sort of like the way the fake concept is in a parallel reality that exists just unseen. In some cultures, that's this dimension and there's infinite possibilities of other dimensions. You know, it means something a little bit different depending where you are, but it always means the same thing what the practitioner does. They right. interface between this world and the spirits and they either bring in rains, they bring healing, they operate in the energy field of someone in another dimension where this person also exists. Because the idea is we exist in all dimensions. We just mm -hmm. don't access that. But a shaman's supposed to be able to access that. Mm -hmm. I think now what is seen as a shaman and a definition that I've heard a few times now is either a medicine worker and not all medicine workers are shamans, mm -hmm. not all shamans are medicine workers. Mm -hmm. um, 
any type of light worker or energy worker, but mm. just because someone does energy work or light work doesn't make them shaman, but this word's very trendy now. And also anyone who is into um, pagan, um, like spiritual infrastructure, you know, you'll pray to the four directions. You believe in the animism that like everything has a spirit, the rock, the tree, the water, whatever. And that um, we can communicate with those spirits. This is actually just basic paganism right. but i think now what's happening is because people are becoming interested in the indigenous life ways again because there's a resurgence of interest in these medicines that there's an interest in the spiritual context surrounding the shaman in which the shaman operates and by adopting that spiritual concept that now makes someone a shaman but the word shaman actually only comes from siberia but this practitioner has many names around the world uh we'll use that word now um it's become widespread enough that the shaman is really like the priest in that tradition. So then my question is, if every Christian is called priest, what do we call priest, right? Mm-hmm. Because just because you are subscribing to the spiritual or cultural or uh, ideological context in which the priest operates, that doesn't make you a priest. That yes. makes you a participant in that spirituality. Exactly. So this may be someone with shamanic belief system right. or shamanic practices, but that doesn't make someone a shaman. Yes. So I think we may need a new word now because mm-hmm. that's what, That's what this seems to have come to mean. And I meet a lot of people who say, well, I set up an altar and I pray to the ancestors and I pray to the four directions and I have these animal totems and I have my spirit animal and I I can see my soul in other lives. Like, okay, this this doesn't make you a shaman, though. This makes you subscribe to shamanic culture, which is the foundation of all pagan systems. Um, Again, in shocking similarity around the world, which is really amazing. There's something in us that where this is innate you know, this belief system. And I think it's cool that it's coming back into the modern space. I think it's offering a lot of things that modern culture has been missing. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. We've become uh, disconnected. A lot of people suffer from feeling disconnected. I think a lot of depression comes from that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the animism aspect is really beautiful. You know, everything's alive. Everything's got a spirit. We need to take care of the earth. We need to take care mm-hmm. of each other. You know, we need to see our similarity as living beings with spirit. You know, I think this is the part that's been missing in our cultural context and is causing a lot of issues, right. but I don't think that that suddenly makes everyone a shaman. Right. So I'm trying to navigate this new space that I've seen emerge in the last couple of years where every third person I meet now is a shaman because they pray to the elements and set up an altar. And there's nothing against that. I think it's good. Right. I just don't know how to describe the priest now. You know right. what I mean? Yes. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a soapbox for you. Again, probably polarizing. You know, I meet a lot of people that that say, I'm a shaman, and I say, what does that mean to you? And I get a different answer every time. <laughs> there's also the concern that they're not coming in with the right basis of work. Right. When they. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like because the medicines especially have mm-hmm. become so accessible mm-hmm. that a lot of people get invested in this kind of work not with proper training right and anyone can wear a feather in their hair and say the right things that doesn't mean they're yes. good at what they do exactly anyone can serve someone a cup of tea it doesn't yes. mean you know how to work with the magic of that medicine you right. know and anyone can learn to sing the ikaros anyone can learn the songs but do you know what they mean do you know how to move the energy of the sound do you understand how the lines work like mm-hmm. there's a lot to know and i think also what's missing is in the indigenous space too you know, a lot of people are going down into the jungle to have these experiences, but yeah. no one in the jungle is taking Prozac. Right. But there's a lethal drug interaction sometimes with these things that I think the indigenous space needs to catch up with also if we're going to bring these worlds together. Right. I think we should. I think it's happening anyway. I think it's the next evolution of consciousness on Earth. I think it's part of what's happening to create that change. Mm-hmm. I also think there's a lot of misinformation. And the more information we have, the more misinformation we have to. Right. Which is why we're doing this because <laughs> yeah. I feel like this needs to. <laughs> so you mentioned like this lethal interactions and that people are going down there into the jungle and they're taking these medicines or not going into the jungle. They might be taking them here, but they're coming in with um, things that are not necessarily part of the tradition. So there may be some difficulty initially to to find a way around that or to work with that or to learn to work with these things now as well. And um, do you feel that that gap can ever be truly closed? Yes. And how? Yes. Okay. Um, every medicine tradition has its own set of ideologies that go with it. Mm-hmm. I think it is now the responsibility of the participant to understand what they're really looking for. 
Yes. Um, if someone is looking for anthropological experience, go have an anthropologically correct experience. Mm -hmm. If someone is looking for a certain type of healing, that may or may not be available in a correct anthropological experience. If some there, it is now also the responsibility of practitioners to be extremely clear about what their belief system is, what their philosophy is as they're moving through these medicines. The medicines do their own work, but it's also the medicine of the practitioner that mm -hmm. is going to influence the experience. So, you hear that? Okay. <laughs> it's like a punctuation from the environment. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it's the responsibility of the practitioner to understand their beliefs and express them clearly. I uh -huh. think, especially in a cultural context, it's hard to express what seems like obvious and clear. Right. You not understanding that it's actually different from other systems of belief. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also important that practitioners ensure that their belief system aligns with what the client is really looking for. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of people of mixed faiths, mixed religions. Sometimes their faith is mixed from other traditions. Sometimes it's very clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's important to be able to honor that. I also think that there are some ideological differences now between what we really need and what is apparent in traditional infrastructure. For example, with ayahuasca specifically, um, it is traditional to give more and more medicine. It's traditional yes. in a lot of places to suggest more and more medicine. It's traditional in a lot of places to focus on suffering like shamanic initiation is brutal right you know it's a process of dying so that you are reborn into something that's no longer human anymore mm -hmm. and the shamanic path as a practitioner isn't a job it's a life way and you right. do forfeit um some of what makes mundane life awesome you must give up because you're no longer really a person anymore mm -hmm. you're a shaman this is something else and you're one part alive and one part not mm -hmm. and it's intense, it's brutal, and that perspective is passed forward in the practices. It's brutal, it's intense, it's harsh. Um, we actually have this infrastructure in our culture too. No pain, no gain. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Or does it though? I think what's happening now is we have two different ends of the spectrum. Spectrum on one end is like strict traditionalism. It adheres to traditional methods. There is no other way, the training, et cetera. This is what it is that you teach. It's got to be the way it's done, been done for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. The other side of the spectrum is this new like neo-shamanic, I'm going to be a light worker and serve medicine and just do energy work in the course of doing medicine. You know, it's, it's not traditional whatsoever. And I think there's something in the middle and the something in the middle is where I always like to be Buddha's middle way. Right. Mm -hmm. So I had this really interesting experience with, can I tell you a story? Yes, like you story ready? Right <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my maestra served medicine, was trained and did everything very traditionally. Now, maestra, to be clear, is um, is a shaman, but is really a shamanic teacher. That's like the doctor degree of shamanism. It's not a title you could buy, or maybe it is now. I don't know. It didn't used to be. Um, but it's supposed to be given by another title, title maestro, maestro. It, it is um, not based on time it's based on performance and capacity this is a legitimate title my maestra doesn't use it i do because it's a badass title she earned it for a reason <laughs> so you know if i had a phd i would go around and make my friends call me doctor too you know <laughs> it is it's, a, it's worth mentioning just because um i think it offers some legitimacy and authority to what it is that i'm sharing so she did the very traditional route very heavy-handed with medicine very go to the underworld and see all your shit, you know, sort through your mire. She was called the keeper of the underworld. This is a big deal title in the ayahuasca tradition, it's considered very advanced level, very deep work. Um, and then she got really involved in the Course in Miracles, actually. Mm -hmm. And she stopped serving medicine for mm -hmm. about a year, actually. And she was always a shamanic maestra. She was always a maestra of ayahuasca. But when she got involved in the Course in Miracles, she discovered an idea that, you know, it's the love of, of God, whatever that is for you, whatever is bigger, you know, if the love of the great spirit or God is unconditional, then why do you suffer to find love? Yeah. Does the means justify the end? Is, is that really, does that really make sense? Would something unconditionally loving ask you to be in pain to receive that love? Right. And so a lot of questions started coming up around the nature of the way shamanic healing works, especially in the medicine, especially in the ayahuasca space. And she decided that she couldn't reconcile the shamanic ask for suffering 
-hmm. and intensity with this perspective that she had grown to really embody, which is that love should be kind, compassionate, unconditional. We all know those qualities, right? Compassion, love, kindness, and, you know, sweetness, gentleness, these qualities that are divine qualities Mm -hmm. all across cultures, these qualities are there. Um, but why in the shamanic work is it so focused on suffering? And auto religion has some way. I mean, with this Christians do the auto flagellation thing, mm-hmm. depending on what their tradition is. You know, we all have some aspect of this. You need to suffer in Santeri and Voodoo. You have to suffer. You have to bleed. You have to give offerings until you have nothing left. Mm-hmm. You know, it's everywhere. But again, is that really best? So I asked her a question. I said, what if and she had this pull, you know, like I want to be with the medicine work. She is a maestra ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. But also, I, I don't know if I believe in the, the foundations of the work anymore, and I want to express something else. And I said, great. What if we did both? What if, if you're a maestra ayahuasca, that means you move the medicine, right? Mm-hmm. Your songs change the course of the experience. So if you're a maestra and you can do this thing, why not do it through the perspective of gentleness and love? Mm-hmm. Why not? You know, why why not do it gently? Yeah. Why not do it? You know, why not move away from the idea that stronger and harder is better? And that's when I looked at her and said, what if we tried? Let's just try this. And then let me bring what I know into the equation, too. Yeah. So then we did guided meditations. And I used the hypnotic and NLP language mm-hmm. patterns to create a very relaxed state. And then she comes in and brings a powerful, beautiful, loving, sweet, joyful, mm-hmm. intense Madison experience. And then we pair that with heavy integration work. So the, I've never seen a program with as high of a success rate as ours. Yeah. I'm so proud to say that. Uh, So proud because it's been many years in the making this this perspective. So I think what's happening here is that we're taking ancient wisdom of varying degrees, right. And then combining it with a new perspective that I think honors what our culture really needs right now. Mm -hmm. Haven't we gone through enough? Haven't we suffered enough? Isn't the whole point to let go of the attachment to suffering itself. Right. So we can just find joy and be happy in life. You know, shit happens. Mm -hmm. Life is hard sometimes. Can we navigate that with grace? Can we find compassion for ourselves now? And I think that's what our culture needs more than ever. So yes, I do believe, and I do practice that there is a way to bring the modern and the ancient together, not mm-hmm. just in the technical methodology, but also in the perspective and ideology. Does that make sense? Yes, makes total sense. What do you feel is the biggest misunderstanding, though, with people outside that are outside of this? Because you're you're um, very knowledgeable in this, obviously. You work in it. You serve medicines. Um, you serve people. You integrate you um but what do you mostly run into with people where you think oh let's go back to square one (laughs) it's a really good question like for me i've heard um the medicine does all the work don't worry about it it doesn't matter who you're with the medicine is it's it's about the medicine it'll take you on the right journey it doesn't matter who's facilitating the medicine's gonna you know work that with you i think you're you're really spot on with that I think you, you're obviously know your shit also. (laughs) And you've had, you've had really positive and really negative experiences yourself. And the truth is set and setting still count. Thank you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, the set and setting includes the medicine of the practitioner. I think that there's an archetype going around of this wounded healer. Mm -hmm. And I do not think that's cute. Uh, I do not think that someone who's deeply damaged should be trying to help others. Mm-hmm. I think that most people who get into healing arts, just like people who get into psychology, they yeah. do it because they need help themselves yeah. and they find something that helps themselves. So then they share it. I think that's beautiful. I don't think anyone is perfectly healthy, happy, whole and healed. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to be on this earth anymore in this life. Uh, I also think that there's a point where if someone is regularly triggered, I think if someone is regularly uh, irritated or mm-hmm. upset or has um, a lot of vengeful thinking, I don't think this person should be a healer. Mm-hmm. You know, I think this person needs to heal themselves. And I mm-hmm. think we mistake what that message is. And exa- ex- for example, this actually happens a lot in ayahuasca, where people will say, the medicine came and told me I'm a healer. I'm a shaman. Yes, of course it does. First of all, ayahuasca is a vine. These medicines have their own personality. She creeps. 
She has crept everywhere. Have we not seen her reach across the whole world right now? She's been, she went from the jungle to the entire world in a matter of like 18 months. It was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this. I mean, only disease spreads faster. I mean, it's unbelievable. And so many hear this message. This is about interpretation, right? This is part of why integration is essential. And this message doesn't mean next weekend, go serve ayahuasca. Yeah. I think a lot of people hear that and they love that feeling of like, oh, I'm a shaman, I'm a healer, I can do this. Medicine told me. That's yeah, great. Your ego just goes, goes just... nuts, right? Absolutely, you're so right. And I think we mistake the meaning of this to say, you know, it means you're a healer, heal yourself. Yeah. Only you can heal yourself. And I think no great healer says, I'm a great healer. Right. They know what they know. They know their shit. They know their skill set. They know their core competency. They know what they can do. But the truth is we only ever heal ourselves and a very good healer should inspire others to heal themselves. And right. I think what happens is people hear these messages or they get these compulsions and they misunderstand it. Mm-hmm. They think it means go out and heal others. When the truth is they're being empowered to heal themselves. Right. And this is a beautiful message that is completely misunderstood. The ego trip goes nuts. And yeah. someone who is ego maniacal in this way is very attracted to this type of work because you get to stand at the front of the room and tell everybody you're going to fix them. Yeah. And that feels very powerful. Yeah. But the truth is this is dangerous. Yes. And a lot of practitioners are in it for this reason. Mm-hmm. They love telling other people what to do. I've heard more than one person saying, this is how I'm going to start my cult because everyone's going to be tripping. I'm going to tell them, believe in me. Like I've, I've seen for this. And I've heard people but, doing, doing simple cacao ceremonies and lacing it with DMT because they uh-huh. wanted to make sure, and they didn't tell anybody they did that, but they wanted to make sure that people walked away and had the best experience with them ever so that they would say, I'm the best shaman or, you know. Exactly. That and unfortunately, a lot of admixtures and ayahuasca are going around too. And it's lethal. It's lethal. Yeah. It's dangerous and it's lethal. Yeah. And it's irresponsible and yeah. it's egotistical and yeah. it's, it's very distressing <laughs> actually, yeah. because there's no way to really know. This is why I started writing. Um, I was two degrees away from someone who died in another ceremony and discovered that I needed to speak. I needed to, to share. I needed to share what I've learned. I couldn't let this happen you know, anymore and, and stand for it. So mm-hmm. I wrote a little ebook about questions to ask a shaman to find out if they're legit, because we don't know how what to ask. We don't know what to look for. And like you said, a lot of people do not believe that the practitioner is a relevant part of the puzzle, but it is, yeah. it is highly a relevant part of the puzzle. And yes, the medicine will do its work, but even in medicines that seem outside of the scope of the, the support of a practitioner, for example, like Kambu and Bufo, mm-hmm. um, yes, the practitioner's medicine is relevant. Right. So it's important to know how your practitioner operates. And just because they're a heritage practitioner doesn't mean they're a good practitioner. Right. You know, there's a lot of shit going on in South America right now that the horror stories that are here are unbelievable. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't share these stories. No, no. Because they go to talk that about something's it. wrong with them. Yes. I had a bad experience. It was wrong with me. And a lot of times practitioners will say this to people. Mm-hmm. Oh, you had a dark experience because you need to work on yourself. Not because the practitioner is fucked up. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's bad. No. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. It's absolutely true. <laughs> How can a person know if the medicine is going to help them before they even go in? If you can explain a little bit what the differences are between combo, bufo, ayahuasca, um, magic mushrooms. <laughs> right. I, well, I love it. You know? Um, yeah, and I think that because of the popularity of some medicines and the stories people hear of the success stories, there's mm-hmm. an attraction to certain medicines that may not actually be right for someone. Right. Um, I actually do, and several times have done uh, speaking engagements where it's just been this topic mm-hmm. of like how to choose your medicine, what they each do, what they're all for. And for every person, it's a little different. And it also depends on your practitioner. So for example, most people turn to combo specifically for physiological reasons. Right. This is health concerns, this is allergies, this is autoimmune disorders, this is um, digestive issues, you know, all kinds of things that are related to metabolic problems and physical problems. My practice is also very emotional and very spiritual because combo for me is very emotional and very spiritual. So mm-hmm. sometimes I have clients come into my practice and they tell me, I never wanted to do combo before, but I really want to do it with you, but I don't know why. And I know why. <laughs> <laughs> I exactly know why, but I've also been doing this a long time. So you have to be a semi-good psychic to be good at this work, I think. So, <laughs> so uh, I know exactly what it is, but I always offer like, do you want me to tell you why I think why, or do you want to discover for yourself? You know, sometimes yeah. that self-discovery is most important. I think ayahuasca 
Sambo is very, just to like touch on it a little bit, because we can do like whole two hours on this. <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> no, I just, because I want um, people to know that there are differences in the medicines. You can't just go and take one and think, oh, it's going to clear up all my stuff. Do like, everything, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, and everyone resonates a little different with different medicines. Right. You know, for example, someone may look be looking for the light bulb inside that ayahuasca turns on, but they have a lot of internal resistance. So maybe doing combo would help them feel that they know how to surrender to the moment. And that empowered surrender is exactly what they need to navigate their life more clearly. So maybe it's not yeah. ayahuasca. Maybe yeah. that's what they need to be able to take a deep look at themselves and feel yes. that that intensity. And a combo, I mean, you buy that ticket, you ride the ride. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? <laughs> that's intense. And uh, it's it's no bullshit. You know? And yeah. I'm very clear about that. It's not for everybody. And, and yeah. a lot of people only do it once. Yeah. And then never do it again. Great. That's, that's, that's another goal. thing. You have to keep needing more. You yeah. Know? That's another thing that I find fascinating is when, when I first heard about these medicines and everything, it was one or two life altering, life altering experiences, right? Now people are going down and doing it like three, four times a year. Some people I know that have done it over 500 times. And I'm like, how is that a medicine then? You know, because a medicine is supposed to heal right <laughs> but if I'm in- have some frequent flyers in my practice I like to call them <laughs> yeah. uh, where they'll come back every now and then pretty often but the only reason I permit this is because they truly learn and integrate and right. change their life every time like mm-hmm. they're really getting the message that's there for them each time and they'll wait till they know that it's right and sometimes they come frequently and then they won't see them again for a year you know um, some people do more and more medicine because they don't understand the message and a lot of practitioners say do more medicine do more medicine yeah. do more medicine you need more medicine you need more medicine oh you think you want to be a healer you need more medicine mm-hmm. and I don't think it's appropriate but you know everyone has their own path so I'm not going to judge it it's not how I operate my practice I also feel like a lot of people lean on the medicines to do the work for them like you said yeah. and yeah. eventually the medicines will teach you that this is not the way I have seen it yeah. many times where people are you know every time they have a breakup they go into ayahuasca ceremony you know mm-hmm. every time something's going on with their money issues then they'll go into bufo to like have a connection with the cosmos to like fix their their self-worth problems you know like I feel like um this is a abusive however that's yes. what the medicine yes. there for so where do you really draw that line you know if you're unwilling to do the work yourself in your life and you lean on the medicines to do the work for you or to create the container for change i think you're missing the point mm-hmm. i also though am a teacher so in my programs i teach i teach right. shamanic methods which are generally it's not done that way and um a lot of practitioners have gotten some flack from that. A lot of practitioners don't like that. They want to keep their trade secrets, but I feel like knowledge is power. Um, and if it helps you feel like you can create a container for yourself to evolve in your own life, then I teach smudging. I teach energy work. I teach a bunch of shit, you know, and I also teach how to make a change for yourself. Self-empowerment has got to be key. And I feel like a lot of practitioners are enjoying the job security right. of needing people to come back more and more and more. Yeah. But Again, everyone's on their own path and in their own journey. And eventually the medicine will give you that message. I've seen it, especially ayahuasca that doesn't tolerate abuse for long. No, no, no. I, I also <laughs> feel that there's, um because I, I was speaking with my Navajo shaman a while, well, years ago, and he mentioned the abuse of marijuana. And he was saying, you know, it's a living spirit and um, it has its own life cycle, its own development arc, its own everything. And we need to respect that. And sometimes she helps and sometimes she doesn't. But if you abuse her, she turns against you because most healing things are poison. So they're not only able to heal, they're also able to bring down. And so people All that things heal- are medicine or poison, depending on use. Yeah. Water is medicine or poison, depending on use. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I found that really fascinating because I felt like so many of us go into those realms thinking it only exists to serve me, you know, (laughs) this is all here just only for me and my issues with the matrix and my interaction with the matrix that doesn't even exist really for those beings in those realms, you know. So I find that's also another thing where I feel it's, it's, it's a handshake between our world and their world. And just as much as we, they change us, we change them too. So it's it's I feel there's there's a lot to be walked with caution you know and to get back to how do people know which medicine is the right one for them or which realm is the right one to enter into to find what they're looking for sometimes it's based on the personality of the person 
Mm-hmm. You know, like I touched on, maybe what they really need is someone really needs this combo to help them know how to surrender and go to flow. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you know, or reconnect with their body. You know, maybe someone's looking for their emotions, but what they are detached from is their physical being, which is the emotions are the body's language, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe they really need to reconnect with their body, and it's not their heart that's the problem; it's their physical attachment to their body. We have a lot of rejection of our body in our culture. Um, sometimes it comes down to just. I don't know, this is going to sound really out there, but just knowing, you know, yes. being mm-hmm. a practitioner, I can, and I've worked with a few different things. I can look at somebody and generally know what they need or don't need, you know, and there are a lot of times I say no, right. You know, a lot of practitioners just say yes to whoever walks in the door because they want to serve. And this is a great thing, but you're also in service to the medicine mm-hmm. and uh, you're right. You know, that's a two way radio for that one, you know, and a lot of times in these medicines, especially with plant medicines, these plants had to give of themselves for us, including sometimes their lives. Mm -hmm. And that life is no less valuable than yours, you know? So that means that we need to respect and honor, you know, what it is that these, these entities also give up. And in our culture, this seems bizarre because we are a little bit separated. We believe that somehow we're a separate being from the earth. We are a product of the earth. We'll go back to the earth. And unless they launch your carcass out into space, you know, we were born here and we'll die here, you know? And, um, you know, we're part of that cycle of life. And I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to to realize that not only have we been given life by this earth, but that this plants, these and fungi, these animals are here and have such a unique pharmacology mm-hmm. that they interact with us in such a way that we can hear them speak. Right. If we listen. Yeah. I did hear a, a badass Ayahuasca ghetto one time tell me, she said, uh, we call it Santa Maria cannabis, Santa Maria one up, get it. <laughs> and uh, sacred, sacred, uh, Santa Maria, sacred cannabis says, um, smoke it, but don't let it smoke you. Yeah. This happens a lot with tobacco also. Tobacco is powerful medicine, but if it's abused, then it becomes poisonous, you know, just like all things. I think the question is, are you really valuing it in the moment that you're using it or are you using it to escape your life or using it to enrich and your life and i think depending on where the motive to circle back around <laughs> where the motivations are that will also determine what medicine is best mm-hmm. you know is, is the motivation to uh, develop a sense of spirit is the motivation to clarify one's mind is the motivation to um release addiction you know is the motivation to uh, and it, it is the addiction problem, you know, a mental thing or a physical thing or both, you know, it's often both, you know, it, a lot of times addiction is a result of traumatic experiences and an unwillingness to be connected to one's own body out of the fear of the heaviness of the feelings available in there. So sometimes addiction problems aren't physical, they're emotional. Right. And once you relieve the emotional element and actually face and deal with the emotional element, the addiction disappears, you know, on its own. So I think where someone's at in their character, where someone's at in their energy, where someone's at in their intention and where someone's at in their fear space, if someone is deeply fearing, you know, a deep inward look, then I will never put someone like this into an ayahuasca experience because it's, it's hard and it's mean, (laughs) you know, I I would I would ease someone into this type of thing. And, and even ayahuasca experiences, if someone is having a lot of anxiety, the answer is not more medicine to obliterate them, which is unfortunately a perspective of a lot of practitioners and, and the traditional way. Mm-hmm. It's to be gentle, mm-hmm. have, have an easier, lighter experience so that the reservoir of faith can be filled, so that the hope can grow, so that the the possibility is bigger than the, you know, the antagonized self and mm-hmm. the mind will move towards this like hopeful possible space instead of immediately run to this like fear-based thinking, you know, Which and a lot of times, yes, it's these medicines, <laughs> help, but they can help better when offered the right infrastructure, you know, and I think that's where leadership becomes really important, you know. Does that answer your question? It's kind yes. of roundabout, you know? <laughs> no, no, no. It's these are not easy questions to answer working with this kind of medicine and in this time and in our society that's going through all these cultural changes as well right. as opening up to, you know, a couple of years ago, people didn't even acknowledge that there was a spiritual world or a spiritual realm. And now it's in our lingo and everybody's talking about it as if it's like, yeah, whatever. But what does that really mean for societies, for people or in certain situations within that? So cool, you know, especially in the US, I now have a couple of psychotherapists that are like actually psychologists, you know, board certified that are working with me um, to develop 
uh, practices around psilocybin use and other things, you know, yeah. these natural medicines. And that was my first medicine discipline actually was, was magic mushrooms, <laughs> psilocybin <laughs> mushrooms. I love them. And, uh, it's such a, a joyful, playful energy, but they'll, they'll clean your clock too. You know, if you yeah. don't know how to handle yourself with it. And I was actually so impressed when I started to see these practitioners saying to me, you know, I realized there is a psycho spiritual element here that I've not been educated on that mm-hmm. I need to learn more about because that's actually what turns out to be working. You know, even if we look at PTSD research um, from veterans using MDMA, a lot of it is connecting that mind body relationship and getting back online with the aspect of self that isn't quantifiable. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of the human experience is not quantifiable or is slowly being quantified in its own way. I mean, we can measure brainwave frequencies and the electromagnetic field of certain emotions and all this is great, but um, you know, it's okay also to be able to approach that, which is not quantifiable in a way that is not really sometimes very describable and to also create a meaningful life-changing experience with that perspective. Mm -hmm. And I love that it's happening. It's happening. You know, finally the U S is, is lifting the prohibition on these uh, psychedelics. And I think this has become wonderful. Um, Mm -hmm. There's definitely going to be a learning curve. I think though, we are also changing the medicines. You're right. And, and they are meeting us in a different space, but also our consciousness is evolving. You know, in my hypnosis practice, I do a lot of like past life progressions and stuff. And I've noticed that originally people did not remember them at all. Now people remember a lot of them. And part of that is my practice. I, you know, I want for that. You know, I think it's more meaningful if we can remember it. But um, I think consciousness is changing. You know, we are constantly in a hypnotic state. Media is designed to be hypnotizing and we're constantly plugged into media. So we are constantly thriving or living or existing in a semi-hypnotized state. We're constantly in and out of trance states. You know, you're driving your car and you just kind of like end up where you're going and you're like, oh, I guess my car knew the way. I don't know how I got here alive, you know. (laughs) Just because you're in a natural state of hypnosis. You know, normally this occurs generally, but I think we're looking for something that's actually in our lives all the time in interesting new ways. And we just haven't figured out how to bridge that gap. Um, But because our consciousness is changing, our relationship to the medicine consciousness is changing as our relationship to each other and our planet is changing and the relationship to ourselves is changing and the medicine's relationship to itself and its message is also changing. You know, it must necessarily, you know? Yeah. Who is best suited to taking medicines? Like, is it for, can anybody just walk in there and say, okay, I'm going to be safe. I'm going to be secure or... In some cases, I actually do a lot of prep work with Mm -hmm. participants. In some cases, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. I think someone who is, you know, again, this also depends on the type of experience they're looking for. So someone comes into my practice and they're very attached to suffering. No pain, no gain. You know, they're very attached to ideology. I do a lot of work with them ahead of time to help clear up some of their identity issues and suffering Mm -hmm. attachments before. Usually these people have issues in their lives too, relationship problems, communication issues, because their mind is predicated to look for pain, right? And I will choose to work with someone in a coaching uh, capacity first uh, mm-hmm. before put, putting them in a medicine ceremony. I also do some private work with people who don't, um, especially my Esther has some clients that do not wish to be in a group setting because of, you know, their name or whatever. Right. Because they are known for some reason um, and they want privacy. Um, but we also do group events. So when we do group work, I also have to be aware of the group dynamic and everybody's energy affects everyone else. So if I'm going to put someone who's attached to suffering in a group environment, that energy is going to leak out into the rest of the space. And that's not what I want for my programs. You know, it's not what the maestro does anymore. So um, someone like that really wants to move through that, then they can go into an indigenous setting and be fully met there, you know, with that. But if someone wants to break that idea and try to live with ease in their life instead of pain, then I will work with them first. But someone who comes in with a perspective, you know what my favorite perspective is? I'll tell you what it is. I hear it sometimes and it actually just totally tickles me. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know anything about this. I just need help. I'll do anything. Tell me what to do. I'm open. I'm I'm, I'm teachable. Like... I I don't know what's happening. I don't know what to expect. I don't know anything. Just help me, please. That perspective of openness and surrender is to me the best possible precursor to an amazing experience because they're coming in completely open. 
open with no attachment to what they think needs to happen, what they think they need. They're just ready for whatever. And I love that perspective. And it's also often a perspective of like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do. Is this wrong? Should I practice with a different medicine first before trying this one? I hear this all the time. I'm going to take mushrooms so I can be ready for ayahuasca. Why? They're not the same medicine. They don't do the same thing. And that's not going to help you. In fact, it harms more because then there's an expectation of a certain type of experience that is not even what is what happens. Yeah. So I hear that a lot too. And I, I just like this perspective very much, but you know, if it helps people feel more comfortable, and comfort. mm -hmm. but uh, Are there the, cases where people who should be doing um, therapy first before they dive into it, like excessive fear, anxiety, or they're on medication, like you mentioned before Prozac or anxiety meds, because I've heard of people that have gone, like I know personally, uh, one person who <laughs> went into a ceremony still on her medication nothing happened for the three day ceremony that she was there. She drank the last bit of it, got bored and drove herself home. Yeah. To me, this is so, a, this is I, failure of the practitioner. Like it, it's the good practitioner should not her. permit someone in the medicine ceremony who's on medication, especially psych psych or psych uh, psychological medication, right? right? Should not permit someone to drive home with medicine in their system. The medicine comes and goes, right? And yeah. it sometimes can be seen as unpredictable. I don't think it's unpredictable, but I've been doing this for a while, you know? <laughs> and we have a very specific methodology. Yeah. Also, I get lucky. I work with an awesome maestra. So, you know, I know, I know what's about to happen. But um, this is totally a practitioner failure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Someone should not be on certain medications. One, because there's a physiological issue. Serotonin syndrome is not a joke. It, can be dangerous, you know, and is totally available if someone is taking um, some type of mood booster, antidepressant, you know, it can be lethal, <laughs> you know what I mean? And also can cause psychotic break. This mm -hmm. I have seen, this is not cute. And it's definitely not um, worth it. I also see people who stop taking their medicine to go into a ceremony. Right. Uh, especially with ayahuasca. This is also dangerous. These type of medications are in your system for a reason. You know, you didn't take it just because you thought it'd be fun. You know, mm -hmm. people don't start taking Prozac because like they want a good time. You know, they start taking Prozac because they're struggling. And unfortunately, in our modern perspective, the missing element is um, those prescribing the medication aren't the ones offering the emotional support. The medication mm -hmm. is there to boost the mood so that the emotions can be more stabilized so that you then can work through your issues. Mm -hmm. Again, the same thing with the medicines. The medicines will fix me. The medicines will heal me. The medication doesn't do it. The medicine won't do it. You do it. The medication and the medicine, they help you, you know, but you're the one who has to do it. Right. And to stop one medication with no therapy in the middle yeah. and no preparation to go into yeah. a ceremony that contains potent compound, the chemicals, you know, pharmacology and offers a powerful experience without, without knowing how to work through your own emotions. It, it does often the opposite of what it's desired. And a lot of people think that, you know, if I, I've been taking mood boosters and antidepressants for years, I'll go to an ayahuasca ceremony and I'll be cured. This is available, mm -hmm. right? But it is less common mm -hmm. than you think. You know, these are the success stories. We always hear the success stories. Yes. There are a lot of unhappy stories too. And especially with the stronger medicines like ayahuasca and with Bufo, a lot of my integration clients are coming from Bufo mm -hmm. uh, ceremonies um, that went awry, you know, yep. and weren't good. And um, almost always it's a set setting problem. Almost always. Mm -hmm. But these are also the type of people that look around and they choose trust in a practitioner and they say, almost always, they say the same thing to me. Well, I saw this one red flag, but I ignored it, you know? <laughs> so you, the wisdom is there if we trust it, you know, if we look back 2020 hindsight, we'll realize that maybe something was amiss and we just didn't understand that we needed to trust that. And this is why I wrote the thing that I wrote. It's being expanded to a bigger book, the mm -hmm. idea of you know, knowing what to look for, knowing what to ask, knowing what answers to listen for, mm -hmm. you know, and, and knowing what a practitioner should know. A lot of times you don't talk directly to the practitioner, but you will talk to someone. And yeah. if you're not talking to someone, don't do this. You right. know? <laughs> don't do this. Don't do this. And sure. so how can somebody be sure they're with the right facilitator though? Like for, in some cases they show up, right. They say all the right lingo. They talk the right talk. They do that, you know, and you only have so much time to like decide what are some telltale signs to 
even at the last minute say, you know what? Nope. Sorry. I already paid for it. Keep the money. I'll walk out. I love that you said that because I think that sunk cost fallacy actually causes more decision-making than it should. Yeah. You know, I've already committed this much. I should stay committed to this thing. This is just, and a lot of practitioners will say, oh, it's, it's normal and natural to have fear come up. Yes. yes. It's yes. So true. And in fact, it's a good thing. It means that you respect the experience. You understand that it's powerful and, and you want to, um, take it seriously. So, uh, it's normal and natural for fears to come up. It is not positive if you're feeling a lot of anxiety. And sometimes I'll have people come into programs and they'll look at me and they say, Kat, I, I'm not feeling so hot. And I said, then don't do it. Don't mm-hmm. do it. It's not a requirement. No one's making you do this. Yeah. If it doesn't feel right, trust that. Trust yes. that. The medicines work on your field before you even consume them. Mm-hmm. When you say yes to entering a medicine experience, it is already begun. At right. that moment, that's when the medicine experience begins. Sometimes just the saying yes, and then the saying no is exactly what you needed to learn. That it's a good thing to stand up for yourself, you know, and to trust your intuition. Maybe that is your big lesson, and that's enough. Sometimes just the decision to seek it out is the healing, you know. So it's really quite amazing how that happens sometimes. And it's it's again, this is where prep and integration can come in handy. I think a lot of times we mistake what we're being what we're being shown. And there's a way to turn even horrible experiences into really positive moments in life, as you know, (laughs) personally. Um, But honestly, that is the, and a lot of people tell me, I don't have an intuition. I can't trust my intuition. I don't know. My intuition leads me to my stuff places. You know, this isn't true. The mind talks you out of or into certain decisions. We can all look back and say, all those relationships did have red flags before I got into them. You know, (laughs) there were those moments. If you can trust that initial like compulsion and not overthink it. Right. Intuition messages don't have justifications. Yeah. Heart messages don't have justifications. If you're hearing reasons or justifications, that's the mind speaking. That's not the heart or intuition speaking. So it took me a long time to accept that too. You know, I went into this practice saying how, how will I ever be a good, Killer, however good, good, whatever, because I'm I'm not psychic, I'm not intuitive. These are skills they're developed and they're learned like any other. We all come in with prepackaged with great intuition. We have to. It's the thing that survived us for all these hundred fifty thousand years. You know, it's the thing that you know. You think you're out in the wild. You know that you're sitting there overthinking whether or not that saber toothed tiger is going to rip your throat out or not. No, you run because that's what your intuition tells you to do. You know, you pick up a pointy stick and you GTFO. You know. <laughs> So our intuition has guided us all this way. It's prepackaged. Um, and if you feel that nudge that says, maybe this isn't right, then yeah. you're right. Trust that first. I also believe that education and knowledge is power, which is why I, what I wrote was, um, and I'll share it with you for free. You know, it's, I, I want information out there. It's, I don't need to charge for it. It's a, this, it's a little thing. It's like 10 pages or something. And it's basically questions you should ask your practitioner and what answers you should listen for. And right. then questions you should be asked by your practitioner. Right. The number one thing I hear is box below a link to yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. I was never given a protocol. Mm-hmm. I was never asked about my medication. I was never asked about mental health problems. Mm-hmm. Don't practice with this person. They're not looking out for you or they don't know to ask these questions, which is just as bad. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> is there a way to um, test if ayahuasca, for example, will work with you? I remember in my very first ceremony, I got like very, very little very minimal amount almost just to see um, if ayahuasca would work with me or not. And then we had to wait and see what happened. And then he kind of, I don't know, discerned some way somehow that, okay, it would be safe to proceed. And that was that he said, he'd said no to other people as well. So, but I never saw someone do that ever after again, or heard. I don't do it that way either. Um, I think after time and experience, you just sort of know, like Mm -hmm. when I speak to someone, I can tell what type of experience they're going to have. And I think this is maybe just experience. I know the Maestro do this, does this. We don't give the same doses to everyone. Yeah. You know, we give the dose that is needed by that person. (laughs) You know what I mean? And we don't always give second or third cups. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, you know, it depends on what is needed by the person. And this, this should be able to be discerned by the practitioner. Again, this is why education and experience are so essential. And if you, here's one of my favorite questions to ask a practitioner. Have you ever had a bad experience in ceremony? And if the answer is no, they're inexperienced because these medicines are intense. Everybody's different and there will be some experience. How did you respond to that bad experience? We'll tell you a lot about what this practitioner values. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone starts having a physical issue, did they bring this person to the hospital? 
or did they just wait it out? You yeah. know, does this person value you or their own skin more? Yeah. And it's, it's a lot, the responsibility of carrying medicine. You have to be on your own shit. You have to be healed as much as possible yourself. You constantly have to be growing and learning, constantly have to be exploring what these medicines teach. You have to live out the message of the medicine. I think when practitioners offer a bunch of medicines, you know, I think the good question to ask as a follow-up is like, what is your, what is your discipline with each of these medicines? How do they show up in your life? Mm-hmm. You know, I meet practitioners who offer everything ever made by creation. Right. But how are they really like living out these messages? Now I offer multiple medicines, but I've spent years in commitment to each one of these individually. And, and I, I try my best to live out these messages in my life, you know, and sometimes these messages are divergent, you right. know, right. you know, one medicine combo says cleanse and clear, rip off the bandaid, let make it happen. And the other, you know, ayahuasca says, have compassion for the experience and just be an observation. So, you know, how do you know what to choose? But as a practitioner, you you'll, you feel a connection to the medicine. A, a really um, masterful practitioner will have a relationship with the medicine outside of its consumption. Right. And I think this is also how it is known by a practitioner, what would work for you, what does not work for you. That's, boom. I think that that's such a profound statement. A master practitioner will have a relationship with these medicines outside of its consumption. And I feel like that's that's part of the problem of our society is it's so consumerist that we don't even contemplate that, whoa, wait a minute, you know, it's not just about consuming everything that comes across our path, but to to have relationships with things again, you know? Absolutely. 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 You're so right. Okay. I remember that's the first time like that me. I had a full combo experience with no combo. And I was like, oh my God, am I losing shit? <laughs> like, full combo experience. And afterwards, I was just so enthralled because I realized that these relationships are just like any relationship. It's not just about the touch. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also about what's in the heart and what's in the mind and what's in the relationship. And especially ayahuasca is a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, It has its own desires, its own energy, its own agenda, its own life, you know, and it's a vine that seeks to creep. It will wrap around whatever it wants to climb up next, you know, and, and, uh, but it is also incredible what it can offer i have a massive respect for this medicine yeah. i don't take service lightly you know i think a lot of practitioners are weekend warriors you know mm-hmm. you know they have a day job and there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that i just i feel like i'm probably a little bit of a stickler i'm probably a i little think that's bit... the best way to go that's why i appreciate your work well, so much i got lucky with yeah. master teachers you know and i've learned to become masterful because mm-hmm less than that was not acceptable to my mm-hmm. teachers mm-hmm. and I'm I'm actually really grateful for that it wasn't easy mm-hmm. and it definitely required a lot of self-evaluation <laughs> a lot of changing but I think that's what entitles me to teach change you yeah. know that's yeah yeah and um, I feel it's so great because um, your integration work goes beyond just a couple hours after the ceremony it's it's you actually accompany people throughout time until whatever they need to have resolved is resolved and i feel that is that is that's what integration work really is because you can't put a time cap on that you can't just say okay after the ceremony let's talk for two hours and then you're you're good to go we did integration work i don't think that's like i feel like it's sufficient at all and you know what for some people it is some yeah. people they get the message, they implement it in their life and they move on. Like some of my frequent flyers that come in, I have one client who, I mean, I'll send some text messages with her. If she needs something, she'll call me. But with the exception of the integration requirement of the pro our programs do have integration requirements um, that she gets it. She implements it into her life and she moves on no matter what her experience was. Maybe she'll have some questions, but she asks questions and then she moves forward. And I'll hear from her six months later telling me all the things that she did to change her life. And it works every time. Um, This isn't necessarily normal. I think, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we misunderstand the messages. We don't make the best use. I think people really look for integration if they've had a hard experience, but Mm -hmm. I think having an amazing experience, the integration work is especially essential because it should change your life forever. Yeah. You know, it should be an amazing moment, a benchmark where everything became different for you. And if you're going to go through the time, cost, expense, hazard, risk, all of it, to do something that is totally outside of a standard operating procedure in our culture, then it should be meaningful. You know what I mean? And this is why I like so much the integration. And I've, I've seen people calling it pre-integration too. I call it prep work, you know, to really prepare oneself for what's available and get the most out of it. But I also work with a lot of healers. So for me, I like to 
give some practices and then give the practices in ceremony to teach through the ceremony work. Um, I like that a lot because I think it opens up more, but then the integration is what makes that practic practical, you know, in your life and like how to take that message and how to call up a visionary state without medicine. Yes, yes. Like, and why would to, you not? That's super once cool. Once you work with the medicine, the medicine is always with you because there's that benchmark in your consciousness. Like it never yes. leaves what you've seen. You cannot unsee. You can't unsee. Exactly, exactly. And there are all kinds of amazing practices that don't require anything but a few minutes of time mm -hmm. to really continue to have those experiences reinforce you for the rest of your life. I've had people come into programs. They never do another ceremony in their life. And they are constantly with the ceremony. It grows with them. And I think yeah. that's also something that's missed is that the medicine work grows with you. Yes. You know, and it should be allowed to change and evolve as you change and evolve too. Yeah. You know, the, the meaning of it can mean something different all the time. Mm -hmm. Just like the meaning of a memory can mean something different all the time of, of an experience in life. You know, being mm -hmm. rigid is not growth oriented. Right. And the flexibility and allowing the experience mm -hmm. to be flexible with you, I think is really cool and mm -hmm. misunderstood a lot. Yeah. I have one last question before my final question. <laughs> Why is the ceremony so important? Like some people say, I can just do it by myself in front of my laptop. I'll order it online and I'll just be fine in my room, in my home. I don't want to be around other people anyways. I don't like other people. I don't trust them. I don't care. I'll just work with the medicine by myself and I'll be good. I so love that you asked me this because I see it all the time now and it um, secretly appalls me because, and actually it's not a secret at all. It appalls me <laughs> because it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Um, these medicines can drop you into a very complete experience. Um, and if you do, even people who are experienced with psychedelics, again, the, the navigating the visionary state when it's very intense may be um, unnavigable, you know, for some, and especially when you're super checked out, you need help. And a lot of these medicines are physiologically taxing too. So as you become more and more exhausted, as you're shitting and puking on yourself, you know, and you're trying to figure out what it means that you're standing in an alien graveyard, you know, what the hell? And then you start seeing the spirits of your dead family and friends around you, and they're all telling you something for you to like feel bad about. Uh, good healer will be able to help you guide you through this experience. If you're by yourself, this, this is the result of a lot of hearing about um, accidental murder and suicide, yeah. you know, and, and even after that experience of having something happen, that's so difficult, you know, I was just wild, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's wild. Right. And I think, Again, part of the medicine experience is the medicine of the practitioner, you know, and so it's so important to find a right practitioner and it's so important to find a practitioner, <laughs> you know, even if there's a lot of experience with these medicines, I think it's a very bad idea to indulge in them on one's own. Now, there are some medicines which are suited to self-service. For mm -hmm. example, psilocybin, magic mushrooms, they're fun. They're sociable. They communicate easily and readily with people. Mm -hmm. They are more easily understood. They're mm -hmm. um, more predictable. They are more available for like joy and fun. They're less physiologically taxing. Even large doses of psilocybin can generally speaking be managed, you mm -hmm. know, um, more easily. Go for it, have fun. <laughs> right. But I also believe in the practitionership because that's what makes it a more useful, profound experience rather than just a good time. Um, mm. But psilocybin mushrooms are available for this, right? Ayahuasca is not. Yeah. It is not a self-service medicine. The only time self-service should ever be attempted is in a shamanic training environment when a practitioner gives you medicine and then tells you figure it out on your own. And that's what happens in, in shamanic initiations, right? Um, oftentimes what happens is the potential shaman will be given a very large dose and will be purposefully taken to the underworld and then left there and then the practitioner will go away um, so that you can learn how to shit show, you know, how to get yourself out of hell because only then are you um, qualified to help someone else out of, right? Um, right. out of the underworld. But generally speaking, the medicine will take you where you need to go. And mm -hmm. that may mean some place that you don't know how to handle. Mm -hmm. And it is said the medicine will never give you more than you can handle. And that's not true. That's, that's not, not true. true. <laughs> it's not true. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe you survive it 
yeah. maybe you survive it, but you, it will change your life yeah. and it may not be a good change. I think that some medicines should not be handled without a qualified practitioner. Ayahuasca is one of them. Bufo is one of them. Iboga is one of them. Um, that's, that's my opinion though. People do it on their own. They have great experiences. People also do it on their own and they accidentally kill each other or themselves or have horrible experiences. I don't think it's worth the risk, you know? Right. And also the medicine of the practitioner is part of what influences the process, which means if you don't have a practitioner, it's you and ayahuasca. And I, yes. you cannot hide from ayahuasca. It's no. everywhere inside you, you know, and, and it knows everything instantly about you. And it will take you exactly where you don't want to go <laughs> immediately. And I think it's worthwhile to have someone there who can, one, help you, and two, who knows how to move the medicine to take you to a place where you can receive healing insight inspiration rather than just a shitty experience right and sometimes healing looks so different from what we expect because um i've done medicines a couple times and i'm done for life i don't need to take it 500 times i need that (laughs) and um that's fine you know and it takes a while i feel for me anyways it took a while to work through everything that has been revealed right and i I feel that um, a lot of people i don't know they're jumping too quickly into it and i really um, appreciate you coming on and speaking about this because especially now where even pharmaceutical companies are getting in on this you know like they're they're recreating ayahuasca now they're recreating it's all over everywhere but i feel we're still not having those hard conversations of what happens when things go wrong you know it kind of gets brushed under the rug and and brushed aside but I know people with diagnosis that they didn't have before and I don't call that I don't know if that's healing maybe that's part of their life path you know some shamans will say that but I don't know you know well in the shamanic tradition if in an initiation experience or in a healing experience you die Mm -hmm. the response to that is your healing was to go be with the spirit world right but in our culture we would prefer to live yes so Again, this is an incompatibility between some traditional and indigenous perspectives and our modern viewpoint. And this is not a bad thing, this incompatibility. It doesn't mean we need to be more indigenous. You know, these are also people doing human sacrifices and all of this too. And is that something we really want to subscribe to? You know, maybe it doesn't have to be. Maybe these practices were grown out of for a reason too, you know? And it, that's okay. It's okay to not be completely invested in a perspective that says you your healing is to die. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't we don't usually prefer to choose that. Usually, we look for these medicines so that we can choose to live. Right. You know? Yes. That's 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 exactly why I went in. I wanted to live. I wanted right. to. Live. And I feel that maybe the healing is not necessarily in the experience, this mind blown thing, but in all the integration work after with wonderful integration specialists such as you and Kat's information is in the description box below so if you need help or you know someone who needs help she's absolutely reachable and um, I'll also be posting a link to her book where you can um, it's an ebook you said a brief one. free little ebook it's about to be made into a much bigger volume we're in process very excited to get it published here soon um, and it'll be a little bit more about the preparation process self-help right I love that I love self support I love self-knowledge self-help um, but this little ebook is mostly just like how to identify a quality practitioner how to find out if your shaman's abroad or if they're really a shaman and it, just because someone is not really a shaman doesn't mean they're not a good practitioner mm-hmm. you know there are lots of good practitioners that aren't shamans right. and there are a lot of amazing shamans that really suck at prep and integration because that's not their core competency and that's fine too find someone who is a good integration specialist and just because they're map certified doesn't mean that they're a great specialist find someone who you resonate with you know yeah. if someone's vibe doesn't click with you then they're you're probably not going to absorb from them what you need, you know? So it's important to maybe ask these questions of integration coaches too, you know, in some ways, obviously how is your medicine prepared is not for an integration specialist, but um, I think the perspective of knowing what to look for is what's going to empower us to make more conscientious decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, in the past, if a local hero healer sucked, they would stop getting employed, you know, but now because of the way things are now, we don't have local healers. We have, you know, the, our community is the world. Mm -hmm. then oftentimes, you know, why is it that shitty restaurants stay open? Well, because people keep going to them not knowing they're shitty, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And a lot of times people will have experiences not realizing, and they think this experience is good because they had a positive outcome, not realizing that the experience wasn't good. Mm -hmm. It wasn't professional. It wasn't organized and it wasn't effective. It was just good enough for their level of ignorance, you know? And there's nothing wrong with that. We all start somewhere. You know what I mean? I learned a lot of things along the way by trial and error. 
you know, I went from teacher to teacher and it took me a while to realize like, oh, this is an amazing teacher. How do I know that? Because those three teachers that I thought were good weren't that great. You know, <laughs> So I think uh, there's nothing wrong with not knowing things. Right. But if the capacity to learn is there, I think um, willful ignorance is uh, dangerous. Mm-hmm. That is, you know. And I'll end on that note, Kat, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your experience, your knowledge, your insights. And I, I wish you all the best on your further journeys. We, of course, are in each other's lives now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I love to share. I teach all the time. I teach every week some random topic of my group's choosing in my Facebook group. If you just Google search Cat Rambo with a C, Cat Rambo Medicine Woman, not Cat Rambo, just Cat Rambo, because there's a brilliant fantasy author with the same name. And she's cool shit. That's not me. <laughs> so if you look up Cat Rambo Medicine Woman, just Google it. You'll see info. You'll see uh, links. You'll see media. You'll see a bunch of shit. My goal is just to share as much as possible. So thank you so much much for having me here and for uh, entertaining my soapboxes and for being um, uh, such an an inspiration honestly to me your boldness your desire to help yourself your willingness to explore a potentially polarizing topic is courageous and exciting you are at the front of what's next in the medicine space so thank you for being you and doing you and and uh, I appreciate you very much thank you Kat <sighs> Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. Let me check to see if there were any questions. One second. Oh, Faya M said, really appreciate this. I'm a therapist and had a beautiful first medicine journey last year. My guide might say she was broken, but she didn't insert herself at all into my integration, and it was top. Ah, as a practitioner, what methods do you use to ensure your spiritual mental protection during sessions? What a good question. I love that question. So I wanted I to close off, but that's my last question. <laughs> we do it? Do go for it? <laughs> <laughs> I actually get this question a lot. I love this question. I work a lot with other healers and other teachers, right? And my goal is to optimize. And um, so I work with a lot of like Reiki masters and like this and craft magic tradition, right? I have background in craft magic. So I love to teach that too. And, um, I get asked about the question about protection a lot. Uh, feeling like you need to protect yourself. This is just my philosophy, okay? Take it or leave it. Feeling like you need to protect yourself implies that you believe you are attackable. If we are an extension of all that is, we are simultaneously everywhere in all things, then all we do is we choose our channel, Right? If you feel like protection magic helps you, I like transmutation bubble exercises. I actually have some of these on my YouTube channel because I like to share them for those who feel that that's useful. If it helps you feel safe. For me, I don't bother with it anymore because I am very conscientious every day, all the time with my channel. All radio stations are playing all at the same time. How do you pick the music you want to listen to? You know, if you pick the classical music station, you don't know if it's going to be Chopin or Mozart, but you know, it's not going to be um, Def Leppard. You know, it's not going to be, you know, Lil Louisi. You know what I mean? It's, it's going to be exactly what it is that is within the range of expectation for that space. So you can, you have the opportunity. I teach like astral projection, lucid dreaming. And people ask me all the time, like, well, if you're traveling other dimensions, then how do, how do you know you're not going to bring something negative back? If you're doing soul retrievals, how do you know that you're not going to bring back something negative? Because I don't subscribe to it. I just don't. And there was a time in my life when I did, and I did a lot of protection work. And there are all kinds of wonderful visualizations and energy work and craft magic, all kinds of shit for that. Um, I don't anymore because you can choose to travel 50,000 dimensions of hell or 50,000 dimensions of heaven. And my perspective is one of um, peace, unconditional love, you know, and uh, I really am conscientious about that in my life, compassion. And in my daily living and daily living gives us so many options and opportunities to really test these theories. And I choose aligned action every time. And I know that in myself, I'm very confident in that. So I don't do protection work anymore. I don't need to, you know, these things don't show up in my field anymore. And if they do, they don't affect me at all. So I do a lot of cleansing and clarity work. So if I pick up something, I flush it out right away. I don't feel any need to carry around other people's emotions. I don't feel affected by other people's problems. And it's not that I don't see them. I see them enough to work with them, but then I don't subscribe to them. So they don't, they don't become part of my field at all. Um, 
if you like protection work, I like transmutation work, the idea that if you put up a bubble or something and things that you don't like bounce off or return to sender, then you're still um, open to the possibility that your bubble could fail. I prefer transmutation exercises rather than blocking where your bubble or pyramid or whatever you're into, your bubble of light um, is made of source, which for me means unconditional love, right? For everyone, it's different. And that means that anything that enters in that field is automatically transmuted into unconditional love. So it can't fail because it doesn't need to block out anything, but anything that comes into it changes automatically. So I have found this really effective too for a lot of like Reiki masters and stuff. They do a lot of protection work, uh, which I think is great. A lot of craft magic practitioners do protection work. I think it's great. Um, so if that's helpful, I hope, right? I don't know if that's useful or not. Um, maybe you change blocking into transmutation work, or if you like, you can change your perspective to one that where it's unneeded. Um, whatever it is that suits where you're at in your practice is perfect. It's not that one's better or different. You know, it's, it's just, they're just different. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Makes sense. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much. And um, you guys, even if you're not into medicines, you just need help working through something, um, feel free to connect with Kat. I'm pretty sure she can help you. <laughs> okay. Kat, thank you so much. And thank you guys for watching. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>